can't wait to see it because hopefully they'll do just as good of a job with Jeremy Camp's story because Jeremy Camp's got an amazing story himself. But <clears throat> I hope he sings it. Grant? I hope it's in it. Yeah. Train himself. So Since he's not that old. Because what was it? Hey, babe, was it a year or two Hey, ago? babe, we got to start Devo. Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel Inland, Devo 30. I'm Pastor Ruben. Thank you for joining us today. We stream live on Facebook every Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. If you're in a neighborhood, love to join us on this on this Wednesday day here of October 30, 29th. Uh, you're more than welcome to join us. We're at 5383 Martin Street in Harupa Valley. Just to give you a little insight, once in a while I get to do that because we... Uh, have some time. We have only 14 verses to go through. So, but just to give you a little bit of insight, um, I think, and not because, well, maybe it is because I'm unique <laughs> in a strange way, <laughs> not, in a, not in a great way, but uh, I love teaching the scriptures and I love teaching them within the context of what it's saying and, and expressing to us in the original language, which can make uh, quite a bit of difference. Um, than just reading it in the English. And so if you, you are interested in finding a church that actually teaches the scriptures and not just say, yeah, we go through the Bible, but then as they're going through, they'll read one verse and talk about the whole chapter and really not hit each verse at a time, maybe even each statement. Uh, we do that here so that we get the true meaning of the scriptures of what is being said. So we get into the original language and its tenses and how Paul is saying it. Uh, so... I'll give you an example. First John three sixteen. You know it says in the beginning was the word. No, that's First John that's, one. Uh, John 1. That's John one one. Yeah. Sixteen is yeah. There, that's a great example, right? I'm uh, misquoting it. We're in John right now. <laughs> yeah, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Uh, in the Greek, it says whoever continually believes in Him. So it is a continual believing. It is a continual clinging and trusting to every single day. Not just a one-time deal, which there are a lot of people who believe, well, I asked Jesus into my heart years ago. Well, how's your life changed? Well, it hasn't, but I asked him into my heart, so I know I'm going to heaven. No, it's a continually, every day, continually having Jesus in your heart. So it makes a big difference and a better understanding. So let's uh, pray and we'll get into Hebrews. Get your Bibles, turn to Hebrews chapter five. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you for your precious word that you have given to us, Lord. It's been written for us, Lord, to study, to understand, and to apply to our lives, Lord. May you give us understanding, Father. I can't do that, Lord. I can just share what the word of God says, and then, Lord, it is you through the power of the Holy Spirit that gives us understanding of your word, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that we would be better Christians, better uh, biblical Christians, Father, than even being Christians and having that Christian worldview, Lord, but having a biblical worldview. What is the text really saying to us uh, as I observe it? And how can I apply it to my lives, to my life? How can I apply it to my daily living? How can it change me? What do I need to do? Uh, how do I need to change? Those are the questions we need to ask ourselves. What emotions, what feelings should I get rid of? What should I crucify? What should I embrace? Oh, Lord, help us, Lord. Please, Lord, through prayer and through the power of the Holy Spirit, help us to seek after you, Lord, completely. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Okay, Hebrews chapter five. So we have about 14 verses, so not a whole lot. The author is going to talk about uh, Jesus being our high priest. Now, if you go back to the Old Testament, we've been going through the book of Leviticus and Numbers on Wednesday uh, evenings, and you're welcome to join us on Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. here. And we've been looking at the Levitical priesthood, especially in light of um, what happened with Moses and Korah. So tonight we'll be in, in Numbers chapter 18. Last time we met, which was several weeks ago, uh, because of my trip, we looked at how some of the priests were, were looking to remove Aaron and put themselves in his place as a high priest and as a leader uh, in, in ministering to God. And so then God 
basically uh, got all the leaders together and said, I want you to throw your, your staffs into uh, the uh, Ark of the Covenant, into the Holy of Holies area, and whichever staff buds, that's the one I have chosen. And of course, Aaron's staff budded. The rest walked away with dead sticks still. Um, and so God chose his man and raised him up to be the high priest. And so dealing with this high priest in the Old Testament, which was a position that that was looked at pretty much every day, and especially once a year in the great day of atonement when they would offer up the sacrifice and he would go into the Holy of Holies <clears throat> where, where God dwelt in the Ark of the Covenant and he would offer up the sacrifice. And it was a big deal. Uh, many a high priest have gone in there and have died because they weren't holy and sanctified, set apart unto the Lord. Uh, many a pastors today die because of the same reason. Um, and so it's a position, it's a, it's a place <clears throat> where uh, God holds highly and ultimately it spoke of Jesus Christ being the ultimate high priest because Aaron was a man and he had his own faults and struggles. We even saw Aaron trying to usurp his authority over Moses even. Uh, and yet God still had grace, grace on him and, and Moses' sister Miriam too who became leprous because of it and then removed the leprosy too after Aaron interceded like Jesus would have interceded, which shows grace. Uh, but the high priest position speaks of something greater than that earthly ministry, that earthly government and structure. There is a spiritual one on top of that. And it's true, even of our churches today, there is a spiritual one. As I teach up there or any pastor teaches, he is standing in the place of a mediator between God and man as he ministers the scriptures as best he can, as he's interpreting them and then giving application. He is, in a sense, like Christ, not that he's Christ at all, or have that authority as Christ does, but to a degree, some authority. But he's ministering to the people, and the people have to receive that ministering and then take it to God. Not to him, but to God in their relationship, because his job is to lead the people to Jesus, who is our high priest, and not to himself. And that's very important. Okay, let's go ahead and, and look at the scriptures here. In context, we saw chapter 4, how Jesus Christ was greater than Moses' ministry. So now he's going to talk about uh, Jesus Christ's ministry greater than the priest's ministry, Aaron's ministry. Which kind of goes along with uh, Numbers chapter 16, 17, 18, and 19, if you really think about it. Go back and read those chapters. Um, and what their ministry spoke of uh, and, and pointed towards Jesus Christ. So verse 1, For every high priest taken from among men is appointed for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sin. That's the job qualification of a high priest, right? He was appointed uh, by men and for men to minister on their behalf. So he was like a mediator. They came to him with their sacrifices and offerings so that then he would offer them to God and mediate on their behalf for their sins that they had committed. And then God would then forgive the men that, off, that, that gave the offerings to the high priest and they would be washed and cleansed, which is a type of Christ. Today, 1 John 1, 9 says that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and wash us and cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. So we don't have to go to a high priest anymore. In Catholicism, uh, your sins cannot be uh, atoned for unless you go to a priest on a Saturday evening or a Saturday or, or confession, in other words, and you go into the church and you go into a booth, which is all dark, you know, and then you open this little screen or the priest opens the screen and you can't really see him but you know it's father killian you know and he knows it's you because he could probably see you it's one of those two-way mirrors you know kind of thing and, and so then you're to confess your sins and of course he takes it to the grave and doesn't tell anybody and when you tell him all your sins he says okay this, this is what i determined to be your penance I want you, because your sins were this bad, I think you ought to say a couple of Hail Marys and maybe seven Our Fathers, and then you'll be fine. And then usually you, you leave the booth and uh, you kneel down in one of the pews and you, then you say those, those prayers and then God forgives you. So you go through this whole routine and ritual to be forgiven of those sins where 
John tells us that all you have to do is confess it to Jesus Christ and he's faithful Amen. just to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So our confession really goes to a greater priest and that is Jesus Christ himself and not to a man. But in the beginning, as he says here, for every high priest taken from among men, and there were many high priests that were taken from men. And, and, and the children of Israel went to the high priest to offer up their sacrifices. He can have compassion, verse 2, he can have compassion on those who are ignorant and going astray, since he himself is also beset by wickedness. Now, and that's true, right? What's the saying that uh, misery loves company? Yeah. So in the sense where sinners understand sinners, right? Mm -hmm. Because we're sinners, we're all wicked. So if someone that's dealing with uh, alcoholism comes up to someone else that's dealing with alcoholism, that guy can have some compassion towards that one that, that's dealing with alcoholism. Now, not in every sense, because we don't all deal with the same sins, and then that's where sometimes we can become judgmental. Well, I don't deal with that, so why are you dealing with it? Well, because that's the area that I s struggle with. You may not. But there's a certain amount of compassion that comes from a priest, a man priest, you know, towards uh, others. I have, well, I, I kind of believe that God puts pastors through the ringer and through things because he's trying to teach them to have compassion on all people. And they have to have more compassion than anyone else because they're dealing with people on a regular basis. And so how can they have compassion with an with a, a alcoholic if they've never you know, really drank? Now some would say, well, you don't have to drink to have compassion. That's true. I agree. But I don't think you'll understand the addiction of it all. Well, truly like one who, who has been an alcoholic like me. Not necessarily alcoholic, but I'm one who drank. And I can understand yeah. the luring of it, the taste of it, the enticement of it all. You know, and so many other sins and so many other struggles. But again, I think it's because God is trying to create in pastors a compassion towards his people. And not that he wants us to sin, but to resist that sin that comes into our lives um, <clears throat> and embrace the struggles knowing that it's working out for something greater and not for ourselves. Like We're like that tree planted by the river of water and it's due season, it gives forth fruit. The fruit isn't for the tree. The fruit is for others to partake of. So it's beset by his own weaknesses. And verse 3, because of this, he is required as for, a, as for the people, so also for himself, to offer for sins. And no man takes his honor to himself, but he who is called by God, just as Aaron was. And so... Um, a position of honor, but really it's a position of grace because God has given that call to Aaron. It wasn't Aaron that earned that position because he didn't. It was because God gave him that position and that's it. And anybody that thinks that they're a pastor because they're gifted, they're wrong. They're wrong. That's arrogance and pride. It's because of God's grace. Now, are there gifted pastors? Of course there are. Are they great speakers? Of course they are. They're great at their words, and, and yes, yes, yes. Sometimes I tell myself, because I'm not any of those, I tell myself, uh, I thank God that I'm not those things, because maybe I'd be even a bigger head. I'd have a bigger head than, than before. <laughs> and so I struggle with my language. I struggle with expressing things. So that's why I say it over in different ways. So hopefully I get my point across, because I know that I don't speak it fluently and, and so forth. But I thank God for that too, because then I also know that if anything good comes out of it, it's not me. You know, it's the Lord that is using me. And so it's God's choosing. Now he goes on and he's going to talk about El, uh, Melchizedek, uh, verse 5. <clears throat> so also Christ did not glorify himself to become high priest, but it was he who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As he also says in another place, and that was in Psalms 2, verse 7, and here's Psalms 10, verse 4, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So like Aaron, God chose Christ to be the high priest. Now wait a minute, but I thought Christ was God. Well, yeah, they all agreed to the choice. <laughs> they all agreed to the choice. He's, Jesus is God, but he's also uh, a man. 
in the flesh. And he had to make a choice to offer up his life as a sacrifice for the sins of mankind. And it was a choice in his behalf. It, it was a choice. He could have chose not to. And I think we need to understand that part of his humanity. There was a point, remember, in the garden where he was like, Father, this cup that you've given me is too much. Uh, he was praying. I've never seen a person pray as hard as Jesus was praying at that time because he literally sweat drops of blood. Mm -hmm. That's how much stress he was going through, anxiety and, and so forth. Uh, there were, and he said clearly to the Father, if there's another cup, if there's another Christ, is there another man, is there another way, is there another system, is there anything other than me having to go to the cross and die for the sins of the world and being separated from you. And I think ultimately that was the thing that concerned Christ was being separated from the Father for those moments when sin, when he became sin, as Second Corinthians says, for us. I think that was the stress factor in his life because he was connected to the Father for all of eternity. And so if you're connected from all eternity... What must that feel like mm. to all of us and be disconnected as a God, you know, as a second part of the Trinity? I, I don't know. I can't even say, I can't even begin to fathom humanly what that would be like. I know what a child feels like when they're disconnected from their mama, you know, for the first time. Uh, you ever get babysat? You know, your kids get babysat and then mama leaves. What does that kid go? Crazy, crying, screaming, don't go, don't leave me in this house. They're going to kill me. They're going to eat me. They, you feel like they're, you know, they're torturing you in some torture rack, you know. And the mom's like, maybe I shouldn't leave my baby here. That separation, anxiety. I don't think God was that way, but you get my point. Yeah. You know, whatever that was, I don't, I don't know. But it caused such stress in Jesus' life that he had to make the choice. And what choice did he make? Not my will, but your will be done, be done Father. And that's the choice that all of us are met with every day, right? When we meet somebody that rubs us the wrong way and we want to scream and yell at them, and then we're like, Father, this cup is too hard for me to bear. I want to scream and yell, but not my will. Your will be done. I'm going to be nice. God bless you. You know, Thank you for that information, and you walk away. It's a crucifying of yourself and letting Christ live through you. And that is so foreign to us. And in fact, I would even suggest the enemy would tell us, you're not being real with yourself. You're almost fake because you know you want to scream and yell because that's how you feel. That's the reality. And yet you're going to just go, oh, God bless you. That's so hypocritical. That's flattery. That's fake love. That's not real love. And you think, wow. I gotta feel real love. And you struggle within yourself. I, I'm telling you this from experience, by the way. You have to get beyond that lie because you have to get into a practice mode where you love your enemies. And it's not easy because there could be sheep or wolves in sheep clothing. They could be harming people and you have to deal with it. Uh, you have to take care of it because you don't want God's sheep to get hurt. And so you have to deal with that situation, but you deal with it with grace and with love and with gentleness, you know, and smiling as you're ushering them out of the church, you know, if that's what you need to do. And it's hard, it's difficult to do, but it's a choice. And so we have choices every day, every day. I got to get up and do the dishes again. Yeah, again, and again, again. Thank God it's not for eternity, right? But that mindset, changing it, Lord, I get to do just dishes. I get to go to church. I get to do this. I get, Lord, because I couldn't do anything without you. So it's about Christ. So Christ made that choice just as Aaron made that choice because God had called him. Who in the days, verse 7, who in the days of his flesh when he had offered up prayers and supplication with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death and was heard because of his godly fear though he was a son yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered and having been perfected he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obeyed him called by God as high priest according to the order of Melchizedek so exactly what I just explained about Jesus suffering and making that choice now uh, I have to look it up in the Greek but it's not that Jesus learned something 
maybe his humanistic part of him, that human part of him, understanding what it's like to learn as a human being to make that choice, to bear through that choice of doing what's right, even as difficult it is, is emotionally, uh, and every fiber of your being is saying do the opposite because that's how strong the flesh can be. And yet he learned what that was to make the right choice. Not that God needed to learn anything. And so I had to make that distinction. But as a human, he learned in that sense. And then he, he mentions Melchizedek there, uh, after the order of Melchizedek. And so you have to go back to the Old Testament to read about uh, Melchizedek who came to the rescue you know, of uh, Abraham, Lot, and, and them, and then how Lot gave of his tithe. This is before the law, by the way. Gave of his tithe to Melchizedek, a tenth of everything that he got. Uh, who had no beginning, no end. Uh, some suggest that Melchizedek was Jesus incarnate before. It could be. We don't know. It doesn't say. But he was a type of, definitely, after the order of Melchizedek, a high priest, even before the law. Right? Even before the law, as, Aaron, as he used Aaron uh, as an example of a high priest, even before the law, there were high priests that were an order of Melchizedek, uh, men that had separated themselves unto unto God's calling. Then it goes on in verse 11, after according to the order of Melchizedek, of whom we have much to say and heard or hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. So he's going to talk more about this, this order of Melchizedek when we get to chapter 7. Uh, so it takes an ear to hear what the Spirit is saying, right? And we'll see that when we get there. Verse 12 to close up. For though, or for through, or though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you. Again, the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who practices only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. Mm. Um, but solid food belonging to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. And he's talking about application here. The practice of what you've learned. If you don't practice what you've learned, it's useless. It's useless. All it is is head knowledge. And there are a lot of people who have a lot of head knowledge a lot of head knowledge, but to practice what's here that gets here is totally different. Uh, you can have head knowledge on how you ought to love people all you want, but as soon as someone rubs you the wrong way, you're screaming and yelling at them. Uh, you're cursing them. You're gossiping about them. You're tail bearing all over the place about them. That's not love. You didn't learn your lesson. You're still a babe in Christ sucking on your mother's you know, milk. Uh, and Paul's saying, you ought to be teachers. And what he means by that as a teacher in the sense of you've experienced it. How can you teach someone something if you haven't experienced it? <clears throat> I can't teach my kids how to be obedient unless I'm obedient. I remember reading an article. Um, it probably was on Facebook. But it was about a criminal who was on death row. <clears throat> And they asked him, do you have any last words to say? And all he said was, my mother should be right here by my side. I'm like, whoa. <laughs> my mom should be right here by my side. Because when I was little, he went on to explain. Uh, when I was little, I stole my first toy. And my mother never said it was wrong. And when I grew up, I stole my first car. And they tried to put me in jail or re uh, turn me in. And my mother defended me. And this whole story went on that way. And so what he said was, my mom never taught me between what was right and wrong. And he blamed his, his mother. So how can you teach someone if you've never experienced yourself? If you've never experienced the pain, how can you comfort someone if you haven't been comforted by the Lord? How can you tell someone that you have to just trust God if you've never trusted God? And so... We need to grow up and start applying the scriptures. I really think that, that interpreting the scriptures is great and, and observing them and understanding them is wonderful. But if that's it, it's nothing. 
What, what did uh, Paul say? That love is just like two brass cymbals, king, just making a bunch of noise, and it's not real love. James even says, look, if you say you have faith and there's no works with it, that's not faith at all. Mm. That's scary, guys. Because if there's no application to it, that means that there's no faith involved. And that means that you're one of those Luke parable of the seeds where you have the seed, you understand the seed, but the seed's never rooted into you that it changes you. And there has to be change, right? Am I saying that they're not saved? I'm saying the Bible says that if you haven't rooted, that you'll be pulled out and thrown into the fire. That's what the Bible says. The Bible says you must be born again in order to enter the kingdom of God. That's what the Bible says. And so if you're not born again, and being born again means that you're going to apply the scriptures. Now, it doesn't mean that you're perfect. And when you make a mistake, and here's the, here's the aspect of, of our humanity, is that we're learning to be obedient because you're not obedient all the time, but you're learning, God, I should have been obedient. Okay, I need to do it the next time and the next time and the next time. And, and you're striving to do that. You're striving to learn. You're striving to practice it, to live it out because I'm a Christian and I live a certain way. I don't care what I feel like. I don't care what it looks like. I'm going to go to church no matter what. I make that choice. I'm going to be committed. I'm going to be loyal. I'm going to submit myself to that so every Sunday I'm in church, I don't care what happens. But there's others like, I don't feel like it. Because they lack the faith. Or they're not born again. And so they live their lives in that wishy-washy state of emotional feelings instead of being obedient to the Lord. And when they learn the obedience, I think that's when the power comes in. Because then the power of resisting the devil gets easier when he comes to tempt. They're like, oh, yeah, I've been through that already. You don't need to go that route. And there's a lot of areas where we need help. But the application is so important. And some of us ought to be teachers by now, teaching others how to resist the devil, teaching others how to truly love, teaching others how we ought to be as believers in Christ Jesus. So, amen. Let's pray. Thank you for joining us, guys. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your precious word. <clears throat> pray, Lord, this morning as we have done this devil devotion, Lord, that we will be challenged with um, the application of your scriptures today, Lord, as we go out there, whether it's loving an individual, whether it's having a right attitude, whether it's in an argument with our spouses that we take the place of humility, Lord, and knowing that we have sin in our own lives, Lord, that we, you have to deal with, Father. We need you, Lord, more and more every day, Lord. Forgive us of our sins, wash us and cleanse us, Father, from all our unrighteousness, and thank you for that cleansing, Lord, that you've given us. We receive it by faith, Lord. We know that you've washed us. Now let us live for you today, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you guys. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for liking us. Share this video. Um, if you have any prayer requests, post them or private message me and we will pray for you. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.